In the multipolar world of the 21st century, the locus of economic attention is shifting toward Eurasia. And as journalist and author Nomi Prinz notes, in this changing economic landscape, the dominance of the Federal Reserve and the Washington Consensus is coming into question for the first time since the end of the Second World War. This is the GRTV Feature Interview with your host, James Corbett, and our special guest, Nomi Prinz. As a former strategist, analyst, and director in the banking industry, and as the author of groundbreaking works like All the President's Bankers, journalist Nomi Prinz has begun focusing her research on the Game of Thrones-style intrigues that are now taking place between central banks that are increasingly competing for a share of the global pie. Prinz discusses this contest in her recent article, The Central Bank Power Shift from West to East, where she notes that The Federal Reserve clings to the status quo, other central banks are vying to knock it down, or at least loosen its grip on them. But the Fed behaves as if it has no idea there are other powerful central banks that want to grab and harness its power. It carries on refusing to acknowledge that there may come a time, sooner rather than later, where its power is attacked. Recently in Tokyo, Japan, I had a chance to sit down with Nomi Prince to discuss this battle behind the scenes between the world's major central banks. I mean, I think the biggest attacker um, or competitor for Federal Reserve's power is is the People's Bank of China, as, as I talked about um, in that article, and, and in general, because what was going on in the post-crisis period as the Federal Reserve was creating a coordinated global effort um, to keep rates at zero, um, and in cases now, and the ECB has them at negative, the Bank of Japan has them at negative, um, was, was to effectively support the financial system of the United States in the beginning of the post-crisis period and, and throughout, because we're still in a period of, of effectively zero interest rates, and even the quantitative easing that the Fed created is, is sort of over, the book of debt, the book of securities that the Fed bought is, is intact. Um, so, so, so it's still a, a policy that's very much um, created by the Fed and, and, and is still implemented and maintained by the Fed. But during the period where, it, where quantitative easing was occurring, where zero interest rates was, was continuing, the People's Bank of China had a lot of very public statements against this idea, against the notion that if you basically feed, and I'm paraphrasing, but if you feed uh, liquidity or cheap money into all of the markets, that it, it, it creates bubbles, it creates uh, unnecessary speculation, that it isn't necessarily um, a value to any kind of real economic growth or, or infrastructure building or long-term sustainability. Um, and as a result, the People's Bank of China the, 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 um, was, was talking about um, how the Fed was, was being a little bit irresponsible. And that was one of the reasons why um, the ren now, the, the Chinese currency, is now part of um, the IMF's um, basket. Right now, the SDR basket, which is new, which just happened as of October 2015, but it was in play for a number of years, because if you're China and all of a sudden you have a financial crisis that occurred outside of your control and a banking crisis that led to that outside of your control and a Federal Reserve that's dictating monetary policy throughout the world, um, what's the alternative? The alternative is to bring your currency more into play um, and, and to criticize that, that very policy. And that, that's exactly what they've been doing and what they've been able to accomplish. And the question is how other central banks um, get onto that framework. And they might not get on from a policy perspective yet, but from an ideology perspective going forward, they can certainly step back and say, all right, well, in the sort of next phase, when we're not at zero interest rates, um, how can we position ourselves so that we aren't required um, to basically behave from a monetary policy perspective like the Fed behaves and wants us to behave. Now, you, you mentioned the, the central banks that are wrangling for, for position in this new order, as it were, of the banking system. But in fact, it's not just central banks. You, you identify the International Monetary Fund as an increasingly right. important, um, almost like a lever of power that different central banks are vying to control. And the PBOC, of course, um, I think, quite famously, from the, the point of the 2008-2009 crisis, arguing for the SDR to become a world reserve currency. The, the People's Bank of China governor has explicitly argued for that. Um, you write in the article, under Lagarde, the IMF is doing more than funding developing, development projects and supplying overall currency directives to the world, as was its original mandate. It is reconstructing new alliances amongst countries not involved in its creation. In doing so, it is building its own power by elevating their allies. It's a fascinating concept. Tell us a little bit about the IMF and its changing allegiances. 
Right, so, so in the beginning when the IMF and the World Bank were created as, as development banks, they were, they were created after World War II and they were created, um, the IMF in particular was a partnership really between the U.S. and Europe that's always been run, um, its president has always been a, a European. Um, when Lagarde became president, actually became the head of the IMF, actually there was um, there was some uh, potential pushback to that. Carstens, who is a central bank head in Mexico, was vying for that position, courted Tim Geithner and other people in Washington to try to get it. Didn't because it was very much that um, old school sort of European U.S. alliance. But under Lagarde and, and in this shifting post crisis dollar-based but but weakening type of an environment, the IMF has really elevated itself um, relative to the World Bank in terms of being able to dictate how central banks act and, and to have a real opinion against the Fed. It was it was Lagarde who basically said when, when Yellen was thinking about raising rates, for example, to begin with, um, and the Fed's in a catch-22 on rates anyway, um, which is which is a separate component of the conversation, but, but she was very vocal um, and public in saying, well, you, you can't because it will hurt the emerging markets. You can't because it will hurt and, and create more instability in the world and you have to wait and there has to be a timing issue. So have, elevating herself and the IMF into the position of, of dictating that kind of, or at least trying to dictate the timing of monetary policy is, is very new. And what's also new is this idea of China coming in, um, as I was talking about before, and, and having a position in the SDR. And if, if the IMF is able to have more bonds associated with linking to the SDR being issued in SDRs, then all of a sudden it becomes more prevalent in terms of currency uh, relationships as well as debt relationships. Um, and that creates a real sort of over power base that, that's more multinational than, than simply being just dollar based. And so when uh, China was first talking about getting into the SDR, the U.S. was of course very against that. Um, and they're still against it, but they just publicly said it was all right um, during the years. But it, it would prefer not to, I think, have had um, its, uh, its, its um, power uh, dictated or, or even moved a little bit by something the IMF is saying. Now, you're here in Tokyo for the purpose of going uh, uh, delivering a lecture on Japan's relations in this, this changing Game of Thrones. And it is interesting to think about the way the Bank of Japan will situate itself as these alliances change, because clearly it has been uh, reliant on the U.S. umbrella for the last 70 years uh, in a lot of different ways, militarily and economically and financially and monetarily. And there is at least... It is coming into view the conceivable idea that the Bank of Japan might realize that they might have more alliances with the PBOC as it starts to gain in power. Um, you talk in the article, you say the alliance of the BOJ and PBOC has not been fleshed out yet, but I believe that's only a matter of time. Old fights might be discarded if economic or financial survival is imperiled, which is what these sharper market moves foreshadow. Tell us about the Bank of Japan and uh, some of the things that are going on in the heads of people like Kuroda at this point. Yeah, well, first of all, there, there is the, the prevalent policy, which, which is negative interest rates. And, and from what I've gleaned on the ground here, that, that policy will be in place um, for the foreseeable future. There, 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 is, there is a concept here that um, it's starting to have some effect in terms of um, recent GDP growth here, and, and, and it, it just needs a couple, uh, another year or two or something to, to stay relatively in that in that realm. But there's also a lot of conversation about, you know, how Japan positions itself relative to the U.S., in particular with regard to the Trump administration. And Trump ran on a platform of, um, and I don't necessarily think that's how it's going to fully unfold, but he ran on a platform of a lot of isolationism. And what that means is, whether it happens in practice or not, the way he operates is to do individual deals. Um, that's how he's been a businessman. It's to basically divide and conquer. So now um, he will try most likely to have individual deals with, with Asian countries as opposed to, say, the U.S. being part of the TPP or something like that, which was dead under the Obama administration anyway. But from the standpoint of Japan, um, they're in a position where, as, as this is unfolding on the U.S. side, um, they are in a position to have stronger alliances with, with, with China, which can be economically beneficial to both, even though they've had historical uh, disagreements. But, but as I mentioned in that, that's something that, you know, when you want to grow your economy, you're not really sure what's going on with the U.S., with your old alliance, or with Europe, because Europe is having its own fragmentations with Brexit and other things that are occurring there. Um, then, then, then you go close to home. You go where there's a growing consumer base, a growing population, growing
growing technology, growing sustainable energy infrastructure uh, projects, and everything else. Um, so, so I think just from a standpoint of survival and growth, it makes sense to, to link in more with China. It also makes sense to take more of a leadership role uh, with respect to South Korea, working with India, basically with respect to BRICS countries, as well as um, the Asian countries to, to begin with, and not necessarily to wait until the U.S. decides to do something or be involved, but to just take the initiative outside of the U.S. And if there's also an ability or a, an opportunity to work with the U.S., that's okay as well. But, but Japan really has an opportunity now um, to, to be more of a leader, actually, in, in, in Asia than I think it's ever had before, given the shift in the U.S. Um, and the rise, rise in China. It has the opportunity to work with China and also has the opportunity to have a leadership role throughout the rest of, of Asia and even with respect to, to Europe as it, as it stabilizes. There, there is so much going on here that really is fascinating. But we tend to get caught up in the, 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 the macrocosmic scale of all of this and looking at the central banks as these almost godlike beings that are you know, deciding our fate. Um, I always like to try to bring it down to the level of regular human beings um, and what they can actually do in their lives. Uh, there are disruptive technologies and ideas that are coming into view that uh, would have been inconceivable 10 years ago and who knows where they'll be at 10 or 20 years from now. Things like blockchain technologies that could truly um, find ways around the traditional banking structures as they exist. What is your sense of, uh, not this in particular, but these types of ideas actually having an effect in disrupting the central bank's game as they're playing it? I mean, I think that the, the conceptually having an external source of currency that can be used by everyone is, 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 is an interesting, it's a good idea. Um, it's, it's almost a globally democratic idea, potentially, but, but, I, but I also fear some of that technology in terms of the transparency of it. Um, if, if I'm talking about a, a real individual person and that's their only source of cash in exchange, it's not that the banks are better, it's not that the central banks are better, it's not that abdicating that control is better, but it's also not clear to me that, um, that, that this current alternative is, is, is necessarily safe. Um, Actually, I was I was uh, just a couple days ago in, in Tokyo. I met up with um, the, the fund manager who who showed me a card um, that has a little gold gram on it. I don't know if you've seen these, but effectively, it looks like it, it's a credit card. It has a, it has a a stripe on it, a magnetic stripe on the back, and there are certain places that take it. Very few, but it's 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 worth sixty dollars. It's, it's it's a gram of gold. Um, and, and just the same way you would use an Apple wallet or something like that, or, or a, a car that's filled, um, you kind of use your allocation of, of that gram of gold, and it's connected to um, a real number for a real block somewhere else. Um, it's, it's, I don't know what the company is. I think it's a German company that's created them. But that idea of having a connection to something real, but also using it as an exchange, um, I think could be an, another way of, of working outside of the general currency platform. And I, I would feel personally safer doing something like that and, and knowing that there's there's an existence of a, of a real asset somewhere behind it. Um, and I think that could be something that could take hold as well outside of, of the, these currency movements and the central bank lock. I think it's it's going to take a while. I mean, these are powerful players. They're, they're shifting themselves um, and they've been entrenched for a very long time. Um, but I think the outside could be something that looks more like a, a hard asset connection than necessarily. Um, a blockchain for me personally. Right, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 certainly people can tend to get hung up on particular mm -hmm. ideas rather than sort of the general concept. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Tell us about the artisans of money. Um, so a lot of what we talked about is, is this um, rise of power and, and also shifting power of central banks. So um, when I wrote All the President's Bankers, it was looking at domestic and foreign policy from the standpoint of the relationship of private bankers powerful private bankers over the decades and, and, and presidents and how they influenced each other um, with respect to the United States and, and its world with the U.S. being centric. Um, but, but the Artisans of Money is looking at the evolution since the financial crisis of how these relationships are, are breaking down and changing because of how the central banks took a, such a powerful role in dictating um, monetary policy, finances, market bubbles, economies on the ground that they've never had um, to this extent before in, in any of these countries' histories. Um, particularly not with respect to coordinated effort that emanated from the U.S. and became and is still um, a prevalent coordinated effort among central banks. So I look at the relationships of the people who are running these institutions, how they change, how they dictate what the decisions are, um, what happens publicly 
um, in terms of what we know about rights or what we know about actions and what actually has happened in the uh, statements because a lot of times, and I like to look at real information, the statements of a central banker and, and things that are sort of hidden within them when you look at them from uh, sort of future at the history, um, you can actually see in time what's going on. So if the Fed does something, but the People's Bank of China was saying something else to the press in China, but you start to move the time frames to, to overlap, you can really see what other countries think of each other um, in a way that you don't see if you simply look at one country. Um, and so I'm just looking at that sort of time lapse and how that's impacted um, the, the national economies and real people on the ground in those, as well as the, the relationships on, a, on an international basis, how that's changed um, since the rise of central bank power in the post-crisis era, um, and also how it's going to change the very nature of, of these west to east alliances. All right. Well, that's an awfully big uh, thing <laughs> to bite off at you. It's, it's a little nuts, I but can that's imagine. what I'm doing. <laughs> well, good luck. I'm very much looking forward to it. So uh, I'm rooting for you to Thank get that you. finished. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll leave it there for today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Now available from globalresearch.ca. The threat of nuclear war. The destabilization of foreign countries. The movement to resist this worldwide aggression. These are the topics addressed in The Globalization of War, America's Long War Against Humanity, the new book by award-winning author Professor Michelle Josadowski. America's hegemonic project in the post-9-11 era is the globalization of war, whereby the U.S. NATO military machine, coupled with covert intelligence operations, economic sanctions, and the thrust of regime change, is deployed in all major regions of the world. The threat of preemptive nuclear war is also used to blackmail countries into submission. This long war against humanity is carried out at the height of the most serious economic crisis in modern history. It is intimately related to a process of financial restructuring, which has resulted in the collapse of national economies and the impoverishment of large sectors of the world population. The ultimate objective is world conquest under the cloak of human rights and Western democracy. Buy your copy today and discover what is being hailed as a must-read and diplomatic dynamite. Available now at globalresearch.ca or wherever fine books are sold.